Good day, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm delighted to have you here with us in the program for the Atlantic World Art Fair 2021. My name is Lisa Howie. I'm the director of Black Pony Gallery and founder of the fair. I want to thank Artsy for having us on their platform and to Butterfield as our lead sponsor. Also a big thank you to the eight participating galleries who have worked very hard behind the scenes making sure that we're all connected and rallied up together. And we put together a robust program of events, including this event today, all of which have been recorded and are available on our YouTube Atlantic World Art Fair channel. I'm delighted to introduce my dear friend, Natalie Urquhart. And she is the executive director of the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands. And I'm very proud to announce that she is launching her first art event uh, this, this year, opening on July 7th. It's the Cayman Art Week, C-A-W. Uh, please check it out when you get a chance. Delighted to have you, Natalie. Thank you so much for joining us today and looking very much forward to your moderated conversation with these talented artists. So thank you. Thank you for having me. It's um, I've been following the fair the last few weeks and um, I'm just, so inspired by everything that we're seeing on the panels, by the artwork that are being featured by the individual galleries and knowing a lot of the gallery owners and their former life as public service art museum curators and directors, it's been um, great to see that transition to support uh, the art community in a time when, when we need it more than ever. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. My gosh, it's a team effort. <laughs> and we couldn't do it without the artists. I always remind no, myself, you know, there's nothing for us to talk about if we don't have this wonderful talent. So it's great for us to get a chance to be able to speak with the artists directly, for people to get to know them as people and uh, to hear more about their processes. So yeah, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, Lisa. And again, um, dear friend, uh, a very, very inspired colleague. Uh, Lisa, you do inspire me daily. So congratulations again on this remarkable initiative. Um, I would like to thank all the four galleries again who are supporting today's event, Black Pony Gallery, Sour Grass, Turn Gallery, Ready Text Art Gallery, and of course all of the other participants, uh, fairs, uh, galleries, fairs, and uh, the artists that are being represented. This platform is truly elevating the voice of Caribbean art and the diversity of thought and production that is being driven from, from within the region. I think importantly in this moment, it is adding visibility to the Caribbean art market. There are so many parts of the Caribbean art ecology, but the market is more critical than ever. With the impact of the pandemic having a profound, um, a, well, a profound impact on artists and cultural animators across the region. And this artsy digital platform is really helping open up this work to new audiences. It builds on existing relationships and has helped us forge new ones that will exist long out of the scope of the affair there. And the project itself, we're talking about transformation today, this project truly is transformative. So our conversation as mentioned today is exploring the notion of transformation and particularly the transformative impact that arts can have on both the maker and viewer. With the last 18 months creating deep rooted anxiety across all areas of society, art has helped us process uncertainty and encouraged new considerations about self and our place in this very uncertain world. We can turn to art for reflection and contemplation, as well as for fresh perspectives on our collective challenges and a deeper understanding of our times. Each of our panelists today, who I am so excited about introducing, have deep admiration for their work. They approach the topic of transformation in unique ways ranging from physical transformation of materials and objects to the retelling or reclaiming of complex histories and narratives to the transformation of the mundane into the sacred. We will discuss some of these themes in relation to their practice, as well as invite them to comment on what drives their art making at this particular moment. To ensure we maximize time for our discussion, I'll briefly summarize our speaker bios, which you've seen rotating on the screen prior to us formally starting after which we will discuss their practice and select works before finally opening up the floor for general discussion. So please remember to share your questions in the comment box so that we can explore these as well. So up first today is Meredith Andrews. And if we could bring Meredith on the screen um, so we can see her. Hi, Meredith, how are you doing? Hello, 
I'm going to just briefly introduce your bio and then and move on to the next bio, but I wanted people to see you as I'm talking about the amazing work that you've done. Meredith is a Bermudian photographer and artist who's been creating professional work for over 20 years. Following the completion of her MA from Goldsmiths in London, she's focused her attention on the telling of untold stories of everyday people and examining the culture and society that surrounds her. Meredith regularly exhibits, including group shows, solo shows in Bermuda, Europe, and the US. And in recent years, and this is what we'll be talking about today, she's turned her attention to sculptural works and photographic works made from recovered ocean plastic. Meredith, we'll see you again in just a minute, but I wanted to bring you up. So we can move on to uh, uh, Lissandro and, and uh, get introduced to L Lissandro. Hi, Lissandro. And I should say Meredith is in Europe, so she's on a different time zone. And Lissandro, you're, you're in the Caribbean right now, correct? Yes, yes, I'm in St. Martin. Perfect. So Lissandro earned his bachelor degree in photography at the Royal Academy of Art in The Hague and received his Masters of Art by Research in Artistic Research at the University of Amsterdam. His ongoing project, which we'll be talking about today, Ghost Island, employs black imagination in order to generate linkages to forgotten pasts and colonial, decolonial identity. Ghost Island also stands for Surreal's insular background in St. Martin and connotates the Caribbean condition of overlapping complex histories. Thanks, Lissandro. And Rodel Warner is our third panelist today. Rodel, hi Rodel, how are you doing? Good to see you. Rodel is a Trinidadian artist working primarily in new media and photographer, photography. His work has been exhibited at the Whitney Museum of American Art, the National Gallery of Jamaica, as well as at the 10th Berlin Biennale in 2018, among others. He's been awarded several residency opportunities and commissions and lives and works between Trinidad, Kingston and Austin, Texas, which I think is where you're dialing in from today, correct? Yes, that's where I am. Excellent, mm -hmm. great. We'll see you again in just a minute. Okay. And then Renee Tosari, who is joining us from Suriname today. Welcome, Renee. Good to see you. Just about see you. There you go. Uh, Renee uh, probably needs no introduction to all of you. Uh, Renee is from Sur Suriname and he has been creating work for many years at this point, um, engaged politically and socially motivated artwork. Previously known especially for your graphic print, your current work, which we'll talk about today, consists mostly of paintings dealing with social and environmental concerns. Educated in the arts in Suriname and the Netherlands, Tassari has spent the majority of his career moving between both countries, and I think we're going to see that a lot in the pieces that we talk about today. In 2018, your extensive career was documented and published in a detailed monologue called René Tassari, Diversity is Power. Congratulations on that amazing project. And René, we'll see you again in just a minute. If we can move back uh, to Meredith now, I'm going to bring Meredith's work up on the screen as well. Hi, Meredith. So if we could Hi. have this slide. So Meredith, this work is not featured in the fair, um, so you're not gonna see it on the fair site, but I know you selected this so that we could begin today by talking about your wider practice, which is what you've been traditionally doing over the last 20 years. And that ranges from portraiture to documentary photography, travel and fashion but each with a strong sense of storytelling that is a connecting thread. Can you tell us more about the scope of your practice and what draws your attention as a photographer in relation to this particular piece, but of course your wider work as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, so this piece for me was surmises my practice as a photographer uh, well. Um, I would say I'm fundamentally a portrait photographer. So even if I am shooting lifestyle or it's a fashion client or whatever the kind of start point be, uh, you know, the human stories and portraiture is always the sort of centerpiece. There's always a human touch to whatever I'm doing, usually. Um, and uh, a lot of my work is also based around collections. So in terms of the portraiture, um, I like to gather, I think there's strength in numbers. So I like to gather um, different people together to um, shots of different people to show that, whether it be people in their, um, their Sunday best clothes or single fathers or security guards. In this case, um, it was more a loose um, 
framework for which I was collecting. And this was this is these uh, young ladies were photographed at the Bermuda Day Parade in 2019, uh, May 24th. So um, and just all of the cultural and heritage splendor that's going on on the day, whether it be the um, people from performing or the spectators. Um, so what I'd like to do is I say that I like to elevate. Um, you know, everyday people. Um, mm -hmm. I'm an everyday person, and so I feel like I can relate quite well to it, but I usually like to make it look a little bit heroic, whether that's with the lighting or the situation. Um, so yeah, this is a good example of that, that, you know, I mean, they look so fabulous. Uh, so, uh, and and also, I guess, aesthetically, they're, um, I'm very drawn to clean backgrounds, clean lines, and allowing the human element to be the complicated part. And I think that really comes out in this piece, because in a way, you can imagine that they're aware that they're on show, but this seems like a moment of pause and sort of contemplation within that, so sort of a, a quiet moment in what must be a very, very uh, overwhelming um, day to be part of this celebration and um, the parade itself. It's exactly. It was, it was this quiet moment right before. And, and one of the, my favorite things about this image is that all four of the girls are looking in different directions. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, and none of them were really concerned about me. So, yeah. Perfect. Well, we're going to move on now to the next slide because uh, I think this is really one of the things that we're really seeing a lot of in the fair in terms of your representation. And it's fascinating talking about the history of collections and how you've approached your practice because we really see this almost coming to the full, almost like a full circle in that these are collections of objects in themselves. Um, and this work is called Herringbone Lighters. Um, tell us to start with a bit more about the wider um, series of ocean plastics, and then we can be more specific about the two pieces on, on display. Yeah, so as I said earlier, you know, I think of myself as a portrait photographer and, and I, I, you know, it's always reacting to people uh, and working with them to, to, to create an image. Uh, and, and for the longest time, particularly when I was assisting, I was very hesitant for still life. Um, but then, uh, and I've bounced around a bit, I moved back to Bermuda, uh, oh, just almost seven years ago. Um, and at that time I was, you know, just exploring the beauty of the island and going on daily, on daily walks most of the time. And I noticed an increase in the amount of plastic that I was seeing. And instead of just walking down the beach, I tended to pick up the plastic. And at first I was just discarding it. Um, but then one day I picked up a, a toothbrush that had washed up and I was sort of fascinated by the object and like that it had this story. And so anyhow, then began my sort of obsession almost with walking on the beaches, cleaning the beaches. Um, and so the process is basically I collect the plastic, I take it home, I, sh I sort through it. A lot of it is just simply discarded properly, um, but then I wash and sort um, what I find. Uh, and this piece, uh, so it's kind of evolved how I've been treating the works um, or, and the, the material. Uh, and so when it's something that is recognizable to me and to the viewer, I find that there's great power in it. Um, so, and these lighters are like, for being a bit of a freak about this, like I, when I see one, I get really excited. It's like <laughs> me finding this little jewel because um, I do love the jewel tones. And because to me, it looks like kind of an expensive treasure. Like you've almost opened this trash chest and there's all these, you know, jewels in there. Um, so, yeah. And I think, again, it, it, the collection by putting them all together, by seeing how many there are. And I mean, this is just a small amount of what I have, let alone what's floating in the sea. Um, so there's a kind of a power to it. Um, but then also with this work, it was at the point where instead of just, you know, documenting it, I wanted the material to kind of, you know, you be, have power in it and how it changes. it. So by making a pattern with it, um, it, it sort of it transforms it yet again. And this piece is, is actually quite different from some of the other ones that I've seen on your website as well. And sometimes there's hundreds and hundreds of pieces um, that are color studies or studies in tone. In this case, it's sort of stepping further into this idea of, of playing with pattern. And that there's almost like um, a traditional fretwork pattern that we might see in a precious um, parquet table or, uh, again, that idea of the gem and the jewel-like. And I, I'm fascinated by sort of reclaimed, transformed objects in this case because they do have such a powerful environmental message. They draw you in because of the beauty of the images. Um, but it's certainly in the work that I do in museums, being able to use this kind of work to 
steward the next generation into um, ocean responsibility and uh, stewardship, I think it's a really, really critical part of, of that. Can we move to the next slide? Absolutely. Because this one is very different again. And I yes. remember what struck me about this one. In the last one, I feel that we're looking at the object itself and the, the material of that object and the beauty, as you said, of the color and the pattern. This one feels very, very personal. It feels suddenly like I can almost identify with the users of these objects that may have been lost or discarded. And it feels much, uh, very, very different in its narrative. Tell, tell us about this work. Yes, I mean, there's sort of a, maybe a little bit more of an intimacy with these objects mm. because, you know, it's a very personal thing, how your comb and how you use it. And we all know what this is immediately. And also the variety of different types of combs for different types of hair. And um, this sort of the way that I've laid this out um, is, is maybe more the work that I have done. And it actually comes from, say, those uh, 17th century um you know, plant guides yeah. or, yeah. or, you know, exactly. a, yeah. from, from the region, you know, those, those guys we have when you're scuba diving and you can see all the fish. Okay. Yes. Um, and so in a way it was sort of like, like almost creating them like they had lives of their own and, and putting them out in that way. Um, but yes, I mean, again, it's, these are objects that we all know what they are. And in a way we're all, there's a sort of a culpability that we all have because we've all probably discarded a comb at some point in our life. Did we dispose of it properly? Um, you know, so it's almost kind of putting responsibility on the viewer uh, in terms of the environmental impact. But then also, you know, I feel like they're li they're little. Each each comb is a little different story. Absolutely, um, I think that's it. There's, you know, you, you sort of get you see the larger picture here, and that's idea of pattern. And you can get lost in the pattern, but then when you zoom in on these individuals, it's very much this sense of who was the user and that um, that personal story is I think very powerful in this particular work. And you're also using the discarded plastics I read um, in a sculptural way as well. So doing this kind of patterning in photography, but tell us more about this, this departure into sculpture. Yeah, so um, in the last two years, I've sort of allowed the materials to speak to me a bit more uh, and kind of guide me with how I was you know, laying them out, arranging them, sorting them. And I found that I, uh, for example, I've done many works with bottles and the bottles are all standing up at different heights and it sort of looks like a cityscape and, um, or, or the gathering of things in a certain way, it, it completely transforms what the work is and it completely transforms what the material is. And it's the same, you know, trash into treasure, finding beauty in the ugly, but, um, yeah, I'm very excited about that aspect of it because I feel like the, the the photographer in me naturally went to a place where I created a 2D image of these 3D objects, but as objects themselves, um, it's it's kind of boundless mm. what you can do with them. Fantastic, and thank you. So it's interesting when we're talking about transformation today and the sort of impact that this transformation has, your work is very, very different from some of the other conversations that we're gonna have today. But um, it's it's quite remarkable and, and so urgent, I think, to be addressing um, what we do with these plastics because we're all living in island nations around the region and really struggling um, with managing this. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that today. We're gonna come back to a group discussion later on so we can talk more specifically about creating in lockdown and the experiences of the last 18 months. But we're going to um, move on now uh, to Rodell Warner. Uh, thank you, Meredith. <coughs> Hi, Rodell. How are you doing? Hi, Natalie. I'm good. Good to see you. Just, you too. I'm really delighted to talk to you today because I've been following your work through the Turn Gallery exhibition, mm -hmm. um, which I, I just found mesmerizing because it really has this mesmerizing quality. And if we can bring up the first slide so that we're, while we're talking, we can see some of this remarkable imagery. So, Rodell, you're working primarily with new media at the intersection between art, photography and technology and exploring ways in which imagery, imagery and transformation are experienced and disseminated. We're looking at two series today where you're using these technological tools to help recontextualize historic narratives, both from a personal sense, and I think as well from a, a wider community sense with some historical narratives from Trinidad, if I'm mm -hmm. correct. Yes. Um, but we're starting with friends and family, so obviously, that is quite um, illustrative of, of, of where these images have come from. So start mm -hmm. off by telling me what inspired you to, to use your own family histories as a starting point. Um, 
You know, uh, around the time that I made this work in uh, 2017, um, my cousin Gerald, who took this photo and a set of photos of uh, me and my family visiting uh, the beach one day in sometime around 1995. Um, so my cousin came to visit, I hadn't seen him in maybe over a decade. And he came with his family who are all new to me, his, his daughters and his wife. And we just got to meet each other and, uh, you know, we were just basically looking at these images and reminiscing and I really wanted to do something with these that um, just kind of, um, just kind of honored our interaction. Um, at the same time, there was a, a, a magazine in Canada called um, Decoy Magazine and they had commissioned me for a, an email subscription that they do where they commission an artist every month to make a small digital work and then they, share it via email. And so I, um, at the time I was working with um, this archive of animations, a set of animations that I was making. I was also working with a set of different collections of photos and I was experimenting with um, intersecting uh, my collections of photos with my animations. And what I found doing this work, and I'd done work like this before, but instead of using um, found images, um, I started using, these are also found images, but from my own family's archive. And I was mm. just able to kind of make a story, make a set of stories out of um, these pictures. Because when you see these pictures for the first time, what you see happening in them, um, what you encounter as the like um, story, the na narrative of the photo is not what was originally going on in the photo. You, you're encountering something new, but you don't really get a sense of what ha was happening in the first place. And so I'm, I'm just making a new story. And um, and so I just ended up uh, just playing with that and 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 kind of intervening in the narratives of a bunch of found photos, starting with this set of family photos, and then moving on to other found photos, not from my family, but of um, from uh, archival photos from uh, starting with Caribbean islands, um, photos that were shot in the last hundred years or so. Uh, and I've just been continuing that practice of kind of um, changing the story of, of found photos with these digital objects that I create. And we're going to see a few more of those in just a minute. But um, is there a way of getting the animation um, up? Because I think we had a photo file. Okay, it's a bit smaller. We wanted to start with the still so you could see the image. Um, but I mean, I think we had to show the video because it's just a remarkable um Remarkable piece. So I'm interested that this was the first of the series with the personal, mm -hmm. and then yeah. moving on to starting to kind of explore and unpack those uh, co collective archives. Um, but if we move on to the second piece, because I, I want to talk about the idea of placement and color in your animations, because mm -hmm. we just saw a work with the red in the stomach, and I think we talked offline about the chakras of the body. And mm -hmm. certainly the first work has a very, um, kind of joyful, energized, emotional, probably because of the reds and the oranges and that core center. This work feels very different um, in the placement of the animation. So tell me a little bit more about your decisions and how you how you place the animations based on the photos or the individual images that you're trying to activate. Yeah, so I, I, I often ex, uh, experiment a lot with the placement and also with which, uh, which objects that I use. And so I, um, I have a sort of a library of objects that I have like maybe maybe about 150 of them now that I've been making since um, maybe like 2011 and I experiment a lot with the shapes and the colors and so when I'm um, working with a photo I kind of go to that library and and pull um, different objects and try them out and I also try them out at different locations around the bodies of the people in the photos and I tried different ones that have different shapes and different colors and that move in different ways until I find something that feels like it resonates somehow. Um, and often the, the, the place that feels most resonant um, is when I put the object over the person's head. Mm. And that, that seems to, that spot over their head is kind of uh, across cultures um, significant. It, um, it's where you find halos. It's where you find the eighth chakra, which is um, generally thought of to do with um, sort of um, not necessarily physical, but mm. spiritual or yeah. 
um, those kinds of concerns. And so often when I place the object over a person's head, it sort of feels like it might have the ability then to speak to their um, interiority. Um, or, you know, it's also where we put thought clouds in comics or where, you know, um, with, with, with thoughts and with thinking is yeah. kind of um, illustrated. So often what ends up happening is that this object over the person's head seems to represent somehow the part of them that you're not able to see by looking at them. Um, one time at uh, Third Horizon Film Festival in 2018, we were doing a talk and somebody in the audience pointed out that often in the images of children, they saw the these objects on the bodies of the children, but in images of adults, they were often over the over the person's head. And that was a really interesting um, yeah. uh, observation because I hadn't realized that until that point. Um, so in the one that we were looking at before, in that image where I'm in it and my brother and my cousin, the, the objects are all in our bodies, but mostly they end up over the, the people's heads. And those are often where they end up with uh, with adults when I am um, just trying to find a location that seems to be resonant with this person's um, aura or um, disposition. Well, there is that tradition, isn't there, of the sort of child, the spirit still being very much kind of um, tangible or the connection to the spirit world being sort of very holistic as mm -hmm. opposed to being removed. And even in terms of creativity, um, there's so many layers that we could discuss there, but this is what I get from this 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 particular work. Um, and again, can we see this in in animation? If it's, I think we have the yeah the video file as well. So, I mean, they 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 really are mesmerizing when you you look at them. I was on the turn site a few weeks ago and sort of got stuck, <laughs> just couldn't pull myself away from me. But I really do. Um, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot in the last few years of this idea of, of kind of colorizing archives and, and bringing that sort of black and white imagery to life so that we, uh, we have more of an emotive engagement with the figures in these, in these historic archives. But this really takes it to another level in terms of accessing that inner sense, as you said, that, that sort of essence or spirit. Um, that just brings brings that interiority, I think, sort of into immediate immediate relief. We're going to move on to the next work because this is the next in the series, which is not the personal archive. This is a historic archive. This is the Trinidadian archive. Can you tell me about where the original um, original archive um, was found and a bit more about that? Oh, this one. So this one is from uh, this image is from Jamaica. Okay. Um, I think I found this image in the New York Public Library archive online. Um, and originally what I found was a black and white image and I used um, an, 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 an AI that's available online to colorize the image. And so this is a set of computers basically or a set of like, okay. I don't know, like servers or something that are like trained on millions of images. So this is basically, um, an artificial intelligence that has um, consumed, processed millions and millions of pictures of human beings and and other you know other things, and has learned to identify plants and water and clouds and things like that. And so it has a it has a sense of what the colors of these things are. And so, in the feed it a black and white image, it can oh that's a human being, and color it in the based on what it's seen. Um, well, that's a plant, and add color to it. So, um, this this image, um, which was shot about a hundred years ago, um, you know, hasn't been seen in color by anybody that's living now, I assume. And um, it's just another uh, uh, variation on sort of um, engaging an archive and changing the story in it, um, and and also in trying to maybe illustrate or visualize the interior life of the people in the picture. And, you know, um, a lot of the pictures that we see in the archive um, from places that were colonized, um, they're not necessarily focused on the interior life or the complexity of the lives of the individuals mm -hmm. in the photos. They're often, um, often focused sort of on human beings as sort of part of the machinery yep. of the empire. And so what I'm also interested in is kind of reminding everybody, reminding myself also that when I see these pictures, there's actually more going on in here than was intended to be captured. And sort of just trying to say, let's remember 
um, that these are people with like really complex lives who yet yeah, are standing in the field with their tools for this picture, but there's more going on here for each of these people. Well, and I think the animation, and in this case, there's a couple of different ways that you've done that. You can't see it very, very well in this image, but there is a sort of sense of light emanating from above one of the um, people. And then the, the moving animation that we've seen previously. I don't think we have the video loop of this, but if we do, it would be great to bring that forward. Um, and it's the blending of the two that I find particularly interesting because that light really um, is a sense of the spirit, um, maybe of that person themselves, but, but maybe others that aren't physically um, in the photograph. But I think mm -hmm. this is coming back to this, this remarkable sense of transforming these unknown um, or unacknowledged, I think maybe is a better word, unacknowledged mm -hmm. individuals, um, as you say, through these colonial archives and, and giving them back more than just a, a face, but this inner identity. Um, it's very, very powerful. So thank you so much. Um, and I wanted to leave you with a, I was really struck by a quote um, from Lise, the amazing Lise Ragbeer's um, hyperallergic article, where you say that you want your digital interventions to point out the role imagination plays when filling in what has been lost. And mm -hmm. I think that speaks so well to it. It's this reclaiming of the lost and those lost identities um, through these animations. So so thank you. And I know you're thank doing you, all absolutely. sorts of other series as well. Um, so definitely mm -hmm. check, check those out. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the session. Um, great, thank you so much. So Lissandro, we're gonna move on to you now. Lissandro Suriel, how are you doing? Hi, hi. We <laughs> first connected. Yeah, pleasure. We first connected with the uh, Tilting Axis Fellowship um, a few moons ago now, uh, certainly pre-pandemic. Everything pre-pandemic seems like a completely different existence in many ways. Um, but I was really struck at the time when you did your Tilting Axis report, which you can see on the website, um, about this question that you posed, do you believe in ghosts? Um, and it was a simple but very powerful question that I think we've all tried to grapple with at different times. Um, you know, it's a very different question, it feels like, when you're in Europe with these, these layers of, of history that can be sometimes more tangible, um, these old buildings that you sort of connect to. And certainly, I think you were in Scotland. I'm a Glasgow alumni, so I, I know what that feels like. Mm. But I think in terms of this new series of yours, uh, Ghost Island, it's sort of taken a, a, a real departure in exploring um, Caribbean folk folklore, history, mythology, our traditions of magical realism in the region, and this idea in many ways to transform that intangible into something tangible. So tell us about this series, which I think you've mentioned might be a whole a life's work. Um, it seems like it's got a, a very long uh, journey. Yes, yes. Well, the, the way I would describe my work or my artistic process is that it's um, trying to document this um, immaterial um, identity, these imaginings, this imagination. It is a documentary of imagination um, of the Atlantic world. And usually, because you mentioned all these ghost stories, and I asked this question, do you believe in ghosts? Um, usually when it's spoken of um, in academia, it's usually seen as, or it's written as an anecdote to a wider study. And it's never really taken as a source of knowledge in and of itself. Imagination is never really taken seriously as a source of knowledge. And for me, this is very problematic um, when thinking of things to know or thinking of how to know of things, um, because in some parts of the world, in indigenous cultures and in black ways of knowing, um, the imagination forms some kind of foundation for things to know. So I'm kind of excavating that imagination this way. Um, and I'm using the, the project to kind of process um, all these seemingly unreal activities, all unreal stories um, that haunt us and that do tell us about um, who we are um, fundamentally. And you talk as well about the, the layering of those stories in the Caribbean. Obviously, so many people have come um, to, from so many different parts of the world to this space, whether forced or voluntary. And I think in this particular piece, tell me about this work, Myths and Sages of West India. Well, in this uh, image, you see um, a woman, a ghostly figure, and she's uh, confronted by the spirit of the Atlantic Ocean. And it's kind of this state of consciousness um, that you walk around in. You walk around like a ghost um, yourself because 
you um, you are you're trying to con reconnect with an identity that you've lost, um, and in this sense, it kind of makes you haunting your own environment. Um, one of the reasons why I'm doing this project or doing this kind of artistic research is because all we've been taught, at least on St. Martin, I can't speak for everyone, um, but we've only been taught that our history starts with um, Columbus's advent of civilization in mm -hmm. the region and that we are only descendants of slaves and our history before that is kind of unknown. Um, and academically, that is hard to excavate um, where you actually come from, um, who you are, what your cultural practices were. All you have to rely on is, um, in most parts, um, the imagination. Um, orature, folkloric figures. So you kind of have to engage with them to, in order to know something about yourself. And, and it is in this way, it's, for me at least, this artistic project has been very transformative because it has allowed me to process my own um, spectral experiences or um, my issues of not knowing things. Because my whole project is rooted in the fact that I do not know um, where I come from. I do not know who I am. That has not, that opportunity has not been afforded to me to find that out through um, orthodox academic means, um, institutions, archives. Um, so I'm exploring the imagination in order to transform my knowledge of the identity that I have. And I think that resonates across the region, oh, of course, beyond that, but um, I think all of us can look at these pieces and, and feel that we have a sense of recognition, even if it's on the periphery of our vision, um, this idea of being reconnected. And I am really captivated. I mentioned that to you offline um, about these works because each one has such an, again, essence of this memory in it. I think you've captured that so beautifully. I know you work with film as well as photography. If we could mm -hmm. go to the next image as well. So here, this is a, has a very different feel. This almost feels like an ancestor or a spirit of the forest. Tell me about uh, the Whispering Palm. Um, well, in a lot of um, black um, philosophies, um, their mysteries reside in nature. And it is from these mysteries that we learn um, how to engage with nature, how to harmonize with nature, but also um, with ourselves. It also said that even um, spirit takes the form of the wind, our ancestors take the form yeah. of the wind, and they reside beneath the earth. Um, so everything kind of trickles down into nature. So for me in my work, um, I always work with nature because for me, I think nature allows for the imagination to breathe. Um, and it also allows for a different kind of engagement with memory. Um, and that we have to remember that um, the environment, the landscape also remembers because it was all, also there. And if you talk about plants, and trees and leaves and what they have to say. Um, here in St. Martin, for example, on these old plantation grounds, you still have these very old trees um, mm -hmm. that are situated there. And then you pass, you walk under them and you think, oh my God, my ancestors probably sat under this tree and told stories. So the trees have heard and they have seen a lot, um, more than we can comprehend. And that is kind of my, um, uh, connotation um, or concept behind uh, the whispering palm. It is an ode to um, the trees and the plants that have been there um, throughout the entire process. And it speaks to so many different mythologies as well, as you said, those overlapping histories. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's it's really interesting to talk about the idea of these ancient trees, because certainly in, in my small island in the Cayman Islands, we have very, very little tangible heritage uh, most of our buildings were, were wooden. Um, we have one stone structure, but it is very difficult to, to feel that tangible connection to the past. So you have to rely on those folklore um, stories, the, the storytelling that's passed down. Um, but often that can be, the more cosmopolitan our communities become, the more we can be removed from those histories. Mm -hmm. And you and I were talking before about, you know, the lawyer or the doctor that still puts salt in the, the corners of the house because we still have these sort of inherent superstitions that are based on um, folklore and mythology, uh, but we still coexist in these spaces. 
Um, and I think that your work really makes that sort of, again, I use the word intangible, tangible or visible um, and, and celebrates it. It allows us to um, engage and, and celebrate those, those histories that we often are told, as you said, aren't um, serious or, 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 or aren't um, uh, worthy of academic study. Uh, so tell me about the what next um, for this, because you, you mentioned this is a very much an ongoing journey. And I think you, you did some footage a couple of weeks ago as part of the fair chasing mermaids or searching for mermaids, I think is another project that you're working on. We don't have a picture, unfortunately, but. Oh no, it's, it's all part of the same series. Cause it's, right. a very, it's, yep. it's, a, it's, a, it's going to all be sub chapters of the series ghost Island. And actually, um, sorry, we do have one more image. If we could move on to that image while Lissandra yeah. is talking so we don't lose it. Sorry, Patrick, that was my fault. Here we go, yeah. Yeah, so Ghost Island, why I say Ghost Island is my life's work is because documenting the imagination of the Caribbean and the wider Black Atlantic is a very big topic and it is a lot to cover. Um, and while I don't try to give people answers on to what their identity is, I would like to give or invite people the opportunity to engage with the imagination. And right now I feel like I am very, very much in the beginning stages of the project. While I have learned a lot, there is still a lot to know because I'm now realizing how much I don't know. Um, so it's all uh, again in line with this uh, transformation because for me, I am really, um, I'm really living my projects. I am really speaking with people and engaging with people. Um, we share ghost stories, we share dreams, and we share all the uncanny um, factual information that comes out of those. For example, I just um, spoke to someone who told me of their dream where they were on a, they were sailing towards a ghost island of their own um, on a boat. And there was this very dark skinned man who was trying to give them uh, a bird on the island. Um, but then they had to escape and they had to fare on the sea. And then this sea serpent had to form a portal to let them leave. And the one thing the man said, they could not um, recall the rest. But what stuck in their mind was something, a word that sounded like itsikiri, itsi, 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 something, itsikiri. And then when they woke up, they just wrote that word down. And when they researched it, when they were fully conscious, um, it turned out that um, the itsikiri are a people of the water in the Delta region of um, Nigeria. Wow. So you have these kind of stories that kind of, this wild imagination that links you to some place in this reality. And while you don't know what that means or if it's just very illogical connections or not, it still gives you a, a direction in which to research. So you, in, in that way you can engage with um, imagination and still pull from it academic information when you use it as a source of inspiration, as an example. And this is, uh, this is the way I'm working and engaging with um, imagination. So yeah, well, that's why. So that, that's, yeah. There's so much more we could talk about and I really do want to continue our conversation another time as well. We're gonna move on to Rene now um, and then we'll come back and have a, a discussion about the sort of impact of this moment as well. Rene, welcome. It's a real pleasure to talk to you today. Yeah. And thank you so much for speaking in English. I try, I try to it. <laughs> well, I know Lissandro, who we just spoke to, said he is available to translate if it's needed, but I, I don't think it will be. Um, I am I'm just delighted to be able to uh, have a, a discussion with, with you today. And there are so many different things we could talk about in your long history of practicing. Um, your printmaking, your collective approach to art as a form of resistance, social development and education. Um, but I know more recently you've moved to painting and using painting to transform the day-to-day -day into the mystical. Um, and I think you've developed a particular technique through which to do that. So if we could have the first slide, um, the self-portrait. Um, this is a great example, I think, of this very, very unusual technique. Can you tell me more about how this came about and how you use it? Yeah. It is uh, the technique is uh, a combination of oil uh, painting and uh, watercolor of acrylic, and uh, <clears throat> the, 
uh, it, 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 it uh, give me uh, a beautiful uh, an, uh, texture. It is uh, patchy and uh, life life in uh, texture. And uh, but the basic of the technique is my experiment because I'm a, a artist who is uh, continually busy with experiments. Uh, mm -hmm. um, all the picture yeah. I make is, uh, is, 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 is basic with experiment. And the moment I got the, the technique, um, I use that for more things like you know, I, I I start uh, with the graphic art, and uh, I always use the the plate to graph in, and after that put uh, ink. But I use also on uh, in graphic art I use the the spiritus varnish. So when I I want uh, I don't want to use uh, a surface. Then I put the the furnace and off, and so uh, it's yeah it is the the the, the principle of uh, water color and uh, and and oil uh, basic is that the 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 oil uh, the oil is push the 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 water out of the of the surface that's what happened is you 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 got uh, a patchy uh, uh, a beautiful texture and that is what i need and, and so if i if i put uh, more things on the canvas then it's my canvas we yeah it, it's it is a, a a playing field I love with, that a playing field with, with uh, an, uh, a lot of things I put in my canvas. So there's a, so, there's a sense well, of experimentation. Can, yeah. Yeah, and a, a sense of chance. It sounds, which is uh, the playfulness, the concept that you are directing the texture, but there's also a life of its own happening in the way that these materials are blending. And I love this piece because I, I like that your, your self-portrait is very figurative, you know, the drawing, and then the, the, the way that the textual element almost takes on this spiritual, this history of your, of your own life. And I think there are symbols here from, from your own history, correct? Lots of different layers of symbols and uh, partly from the Netherlands, partly from QSL and um, the position of the drawing and the texture is, is beautiful. Yes, this, uh, th that is what I mean. Uh, 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 the moment uh, you're busy, uh, you have to focus on the dry time of, of, of your, uh, your, your paint because that is, that is the most uh, difficult uh, moment to get the 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 a strong enough uh, a texture mm -hmm. and some 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 people uh, call that uh, it it like a little batik <laughs> this um, a link of my uh, my roots from uh, Jaffa Indonesia you know Middle Jaffa there is where my uh, my uh, grand and grandfather and grandmother come uh, from well and let's move on to the alacondre piece because we want to talk about okay that those is layers uh, yeah. of, yes here we go so, so tell us about also, this history. also an example of the the use who i use the 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 texture the surface um you know alacondre is 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 is, is for me uh something like i i born in alacondre i i i'm born in alacondre because i born in a country 
with different of uh, of uh, people with different uh, culture and um, different on uh, uh, a color skin and um, different uh, religion. So uh, I love that. Well, thank you, and it resonates, I think, to all of us across the Caribbean. These layers of histories and stories and mythologies that overlap, as we've seen in the work of some of our other guests today. We're going to move on to the next piece, which is the flower garden. That is the flower garden, and here I try. I try to, um, if you if you if you look the the, the faces, then uh, is uh, I use the the. The characteristic phases of from uh, Egypt. It, it gives me a little more mystic in. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you can see the mystic. You can feel that also. And um, why why uh, the flower garden? Because the flower garden. Uh, uh, a, a lot of people in Suriname use uh, uh, um, the 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 flower garden in 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 poema in uh, uh, poetis in 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 uh, music um, and I think okay uh, the same faces but different color on the faces and that is. One of the reasons why Alacondre is uh, one of us, because Alacondre means also the whole world in one. And that is what we feel in, in Suriname. And it's not only uh, the drift, dif different in, in, in color, uh, but also different in uh, in, in some beauty aspect, mm -hmm. the, the nature, the uh, uh, the the nineteen percent of bush in Suriname, uh, jungle, <laughs> this uh, that all make uh, me happy when I uh, talk with people about the Alacondre, and here you can see also the the texture. Of the combination, acrylic and oil fair and a and a, and a painting. That and is I, the basic. Uh, that is the basic of the technique I use. You use, right? and it's very different here than it was in the self-portrait. And I wanted to end on this piece because um, not only does it feel like a celebration of beauty when we talk about the transformative qualities that art can bring to the viewer, particularly in this moment, but it also ties in some of the threads that we've seen in Lissandro's work and of course Riddell's work with this sense of the spiritual above us and the, uh -huh. the, the honoring and the reflection of nature as, as an intrinsic um, partner um, and relationship that, that we all have in the region that we live in. Um, so thank you for sharing. I think this was a beautiful piece to conclude on. We are very uh, close to the end. So if I could bring all of the speakers back on to the screen. We can have a split screen there. Um, I was going to, I've got one comment. I'm just thinking if we have any actual questions, there's some fantastic comments about your work. So please look in the chat and uh, no direct questions just yet. But what I wanted to ask you all, because I was I was struck by Riddell's, uh, sorry, Renee's work all being last year, the works that you're submitting 2020. So clearly the, the lockdown and the pandemic that we've all experienced have been a time of immense creativity for you. Um, how have the other artists, um, how have you navigated? Because many artists that I speak to couldn't create at all because of the pressure of the, the moment. So it seems like it was either immensely creative or, or otherwise. Um, Meredith, how have you found um, the, last, the last few months and, and, and how are you uh, creating now? I found it immensely creative period for me. Um, in a way, the f the forced lockdowns and parameters, and not being able to leave the island as well. Um, I, 
it was kind of a great advantage. I did a, a, a series of photographing people within my half mile because that's the only place I could go, right. uh, you know, and then also the plastic. Uh, I had a lot more time to spend with the plastic. So um, <laughs> and it was for me, coming, of course. If, yeah, so for me, and particularly in connection to the island, uh, I found it. I found it to be a very creative time. And we really have rediscovered that connection um, very forcefully, I think. And Lissandro, what about you? Because you often work with groups of people. That must have been slightly more tricky to navigate. Yeah, that was tricky. I wasn't able to do a lot for a while. But for me, I was also very thankful uh, for the lockdown because it was the perfect excuse to disengage with the reality for a while and to engage with the imagination. So there was a lot of reading, a lot of dreaming, a lot of processing um, in ways that are just as important to the projects um, for me. So, yeah. And to have the gift of that time, it, it was quite remarkable in, in many ways, yeah. despite the immense challenges that everyone has faced. And, and Rodel, what about yourself? Um, I had a similar response. Um, just having more time to, uh, to work on things was very useful, um, especially since I work on my computer a lot. And um, so, I, you know, being at home is just perfect for that. So I actually found um, some new directions that I'm exploring and just had time to learn new things that I usually find uh, difficult to find that kind of time for because I'm just on a go all the time. So, um, and a lot of artists that I talk to, this is their experience, um, just having more more time to work on things um, generally is a positive thing. Wonderful. And Renee, you're obviously working yeah. prolifically right now, it seems. Yeah, for me it was also uh, okay because you have uh, plenty of time to uh, do do things, uh, and and that's all. Uh, I stay I stay at home. I don't go outside uh, so much. The only thing I do is uh, uh, I take my bicycle in the morning and I I am uh, for a couple of hours I'm back to home. And then I can do my things. And you can create. Yes. Well, I think as a, as a curator, or, a, or a, I would say a, a viewer of art rather than a maker, I just want to say a very, very big thank you to all of you because your work has in, inspired me and I've got to know it a lot better in the last couple of weeks. Um, and I'm looking forward to continuing to do that. So thank you for creating for all of us in lockdown. It's been a difficult time to navigate, but it really has helped transform the experience for all of us. Um, I want to say a very, very big thank you to um, all of the participating galleries. And I know we are out of time now. We did have one question um, from Sourgrass about, um, uh, here we go. Uh, this is for Lissandro, I believe. There are many interconnections throughout your practice, the sublime, spiritu spirituality, nature, etc. What brings you the most joy while you are in manifestation mode? And this is actually for everybody. I love that concept of what brings the joy in the moment. And we'll, we'll have a quick wrap up with that question because we are out of time. But if anyone would like to, to jump forward and share, what manifests uh, well, joy? Well, for me, what, it, what makes me the happiest is because I never know what it's going to look like um, when I'm done with the shoot. So for me, the surprise of which spirit came into the picture and, <laughs> and did its thing, for me, that's the most... Uh, euphoric aspect of my working process. Thank you. Meredith or Rodel, Renee, would you like to, to comment at all? Uh, I think in a way, like when I'm, I don't think you're ever really complete or it's, a work is never really complete, but in a way when I've sort of finished that thought and then I can move on to the next one. I, I'm always excited before the shoot or before the creation. So in a way, like when one is done and I get to do the next one, I think for me, that's quite joyous. The conclusion and the beginning again. Yes, it's yeah. exciting. Yeah. And Rodel, what about you? Um, for me, I think it's when I find something new, like, so, you know, you start off with an idea and you're trying to do something and, uh, and you know, I often have an idea of what I'm going for, but somewhere in the middle, if it's going well, the best thing that can, that, that usually, the best thing that can happen and the thing that makes me happiest, I think, is when I find a way to do something that's not how I expected it would go or like, that even like 
causes me to throw up my initial idea in the first place because I'm so happy I found this new thing to do or this new way to, to illustrate this thing or to, to express this idea or whatever. And, um, you know, in the best situation, that's what happens and that makes me really happy. Thank you. And Renee, I feel joy by just looking at the, the, the textual aspect of your work. I can feel that you have joy while that comes about. Tell me about that. Uh, yes, I. Uh, it's a pressure for me, uh, but uh, I have to learn more about the uh, circ uh, conversation. But it's okay. I I try to uh, create that uh, new uh, new uh, ID, and um, I still uh, I still going on. <laughs> And that you is have my a, a remarkable career. It's been fantastic to research and learn more about it. So thank you. And I will yes. wrap up there. I want to say thank you to everybody again. It's been a real pleasure to get to know you and your work better. I look forward to keeping those, those networks and dialogues open. And a very, very big thank you to Lisa Howie, the Atlantic World Art Fair, Butterfield, Artsy, and all of the participating galleries today, particularly the ones supporting this panel, Black Pony Gallery, Sourgrass, Turn Gallery, and the ReadyText Gallery. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.